Okay. Hello? Somebody, am I good to go? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. How are you? This is, I hope, hope my, this isn't too strange. Okay, um, I'm Edward Gillespie, Detective Edward Gillespie from the Baltimore City Police Department. Um, so prior to becoming an officer, I was in academia and uh, spent some time teaching humanities, uh, history and literature in particular. Um, after 9-11, I decided to become a police officer and uh, I've worked in a few different, co different co capacities. And I think most importantly, I've worked in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore, which has been noted as being one of the deadliest cities in America, Baltimore, which was historically one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Um, the city with uh, a police department with a terrible reputation in terms of human rights, in terms of the treatment of people of, of color, and uh, in terms of the treatment of the US Constitution, in fact. Um, we sport a lot of Confederate statues, and we have a long history of first, fourth, and eighth amendment violations. So given all of that, we actually do still have a police force that is very committed to reform and a police force, a very diverse police force that is being reformed uh, quite rapidly. So as I teach cross-cultural communication and as I discuss social justice with my officers, I tend to look towards uh, my background with literature and with history. Um, I don't know that either one is a bailiwick of mine, but um, I kind of class them under, under humanities. Um, and I use what's called the Cross model. Um, a sociologist named Terry Cross from 1988 came up with uh, the Cross model of cross-communicate, cross-cultural understanding. And so I try to get my officers to work themselves into these, the different frameworks there that he has. Now, Terry Cross starts off by saying, um, what is what are the stages through which we go as we try to reach cultural competence? And I use literary examples to show my officers, well, this is what it looks like in many cases. And what I found though is as I go through this, it's very easy to look at, I mean, obviously we look at literature and we say, okay, this is a this can be a gateway or a conduit to understanding a different culture which is great. But that can all, there can also be pitfalls in that, can't they? I mean, I could use a voice, I could write, use a voice that's not authentic or not qualified. And we might not know the difference in many cases. Um, I think lots of people might feel that they've done a great job of cross-cultural competence by, you know, maybe watching Gone with the Wind, you know? I mean, there's no telling. Um, so, the first stage is cultural dis cultural destructiveness, right? And um, that pretty much speaks for itself. You know, anytime you have a culture that's just made to look inferior, uh, its victory is gained by the uh, uh, the dis the destruction of that that character that represents that culture. You know, we we see that pretty pretty clearly. But I think most of my officers fall into what I would call cultural incapacity which is really interesting. And I think when we start looking at literature as the key to someone else's culture, we have to ask how authentic is this voice? Is it lending itself to the other's perception? Even though it's just very important to note, this may be a very, as far as that individual's concerned, sympathetic view or empathetic view of that culture, right? It can lead to cultural incapacity. Now, I um, when I was 25, I uh, I read On the Road for the first time, Jack Kerouac, and I, of course I was blown away. You know, Dean Moriarty, the main character, was this Dionysian, and he didn't live by the rules. And I thought, wow, you know, I was 25. I was like, wow, you know, that's really pretty cool. And he looked at all these different cultures around him, and he drew from them, and he talked in poetic terms. You know, 25 years later, I went back to On the Road. I said, oh, let me take a look at this again. You know, I had just visited San Francisco, and uh, Hung out on, hung out at the City Lights bookstore, and wow, you know, let me take a look at this again. And as I read through it, I thought, my gosh, what, how bigoted so much of what takes place between these conversations. And I'm not, I, partway through the book, I even said, do I not like this book? 
but I, I realized I just, I changed my view of it, changed. And my view of, um, I guess, the patriarchy, my view of cultural incapacity, my view of the role of, this is funny, the role of people of color, LGBTQ people, women, working class people as props in the rebellion of a basically middle-class white guy. In doing that though, I still inform myself in terms of a culture, right? I mean, I still got some insight. I got some insight to this, there's kind of an internal struggle, this white guy struggle. And that's not me, I'm not saying that in a you know pejorative white guy, you know, pejorative sense. This guy, and he even talks about it, saying you know, he feels trapped in his whiteness. So it's funny because I thought, well, am I kind of slag heaping this book because of the way it treats the marginalized? Well, no, not really. It's giving me more insight into what's going on in the, in this guy's culture, this you know post World War II American white man rebellion. You know, um, when he says things like, "I'm looking at on the road," and says. He's talking about jazz. Jazz is a constant, you know, jazz just runs through it. And on the one hand, he's thinking, wow, you know, he's embracing this culture. He is advocating for this black American culture. Okay, black, jazz and, and, and blues, jazz and blues. The third sax was an alto. 18 year old, cool, com, con, contemplative young Charlie Parker type Negro from high school with a broad gash mouth taller than the rest and grave. Okay. A Charlie Parker type Negro, he was, you know. Now, so it's still very much an outsider's view, very much a, you know, I'm using this person as a type of prop, you know. Um, when he says, I won't, I won't belabor too much here, but I just found so many awesome passages here. It says, um, you know, the beginning. So there's, they're living amongst some uh, Mexican migrant workers, and he says, you know. Excuse me, they're in Mexico. I'm beginning to like this smell. I can't smell myself anymore. What myth, what ghost, what spirit? I told Dean about it when he woke up. He thought it was dreaming. Then he recalls faintly dreaming of a white horse. Okay, so they have these mystical experiences around see, the Indians along the road. Um, found myself my little notes even right here. Uses people of color as props. Okay. Um, it's not the kind of sweat we have. He's talking about the sweat of Mexicans. It's always there because it's always hot the year round and she knows nothing of sweat. She was born with sweat and dies with sweat. There are great brown innocent eyes looking into ours with such soulful intensity that not one of us had the slightest sexual thought about them. These are the Mexican women. Moreover, they were very young. So as we go through this, we start seeing, wow, you know, where I thought he was giving voice, because it's very easy for us to say, how can I understand these different marginalized cultures? Well, look, Jack Kerouac has a very sympathetic view of them. But as I go through it, I start to realize, right, this is what Cross would call cultural incapacity. So this is when I say to many of my officers, you know, you are you looking, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, am I guilty of this? Of course. I came from I come from a very much upper middle class, well-educated background. My dad had a PhD, found myself working in Sandtown of West Baltimore, where the average individual didn't graduate high school. And I can look at these different semiotic indicators and decide what they mean to me. And that can go in a number of different ways, right? You know, what is attractive? What isn't? Um, at one point, Dean Moriarty says, you know, I wish I were colored. The colored are so happy. The colored have such, now remember this was written in 1954. Were a lot of black people like overly happy in 1954? Probably not, especially in the South where they're um, traveling. Now, along with this, so along with this, let me give you a contrasting view here. I reread Ma Rainey's Black Bottom by August Wilson. And in this one passage, it addresses what's going on with Dean Moriarty. Ma Rainey says, White folks don't understand about the blues. They hear it come out, but they don't know how it got there. They don't understand that's life. That's life's way of talking. You don't sing to feel better. You sing 
because it's a way of understanding life. Later she says, the blues help you get out of bed in, in the morning. You get up knowing you ain't alone. There's something else in something else in, in, in the world. Something's been added by that song. This be an empty world without blues. I take that emptiness and try to fill it up with something. Right there, I can make the leap to what Cross would call cultural pre-competence. If I can say, you know what? I don't know what you're trying to fill. Now, I know Dean Moriarty was trying to fill an emptiness that he felt was created by his whiteness. So we always have to ask, when I am using literature to access another culture, because ultimately, that step towards social justice is understanding your emptiness or understanding that there's an emptiness that I don't understand. I think that's pivotal. I think when I read Gloria Anseldua's writing in this bridge called my called my back, and know that I don't know the experience of a woman of color, but okay, this opens the door. When I read the uh, vagina monologues, I say, okay, you're right. As a man, as my male privilege, I don't get it. So this is where my work has to start, and part of it has to be understanding. I'm never going to really feel what Gloria Anseldua meant or what Eve Einsler meant when they talked about an emptiness they tried to fill. But that's a good step towards pre-competence, being able to say, I don't know what I don't know, right? Um, so, you know, not meaning to meander too much here, but I, what I'm trying to say is we can get stuck on multiculturalism and not make our way to social justice. We can say, well, here's a, here's a representation it's sympathetic, I, it makes me happy, it makes it says good things about you. Here's this great role you get to play. Instead of saying, well, what's driving this? And don't forget, part of that multiculturalism is I get you, I understand it, I've put you in a box and you're there, all right. You know, beyond saying, you know, there's maybe there's a pain that drives you that I don't get. When Ma Rainey talks about that emptiness, it would be great if Dean Moriarty were able to say, if Ma Rainey could talk to Dean Moriarty across, across books and say, you filled your white man emptiness, but you don't understand my colored emptiness. My jazz, my pain is just something you're using to fill yourself up. And so one thing that's, uh, that I, on which I, um, I try to instruct my officers is to try to not see this person in your context. Try to not see this culture in your context. I know that's a big mistake that I made very often. I looked at behaviors in you know, inner city, low income Baltimore, and I tried to compare them to the upper middle class suburb in which I was raised. And I tried to fit it or not fit it. Well, these are things I wish I had, but these are things I wish I didn't versus saying, this is a different experience, right? So does that mean though, now here's the question, does that mean that a writer, who is not of that marginalized group cannot write with authenticity. Um, and I would say no. Uh, one of my favorite books is Carson McC See, let me show you how much I love this book. No cover, right? I got this when I was 17. Um, this is Carson McCullers, uh, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter. And um, one of the most sympathetic renderings of a black character I think I've ever seen um, was uh, if everyone's no one's read right, the character Dr. Copeland, who is a black doctor and so a black intellectual in the rural South of the 1930s and 40s, and uh, so he serves the black community. Of course, he's you know he's a communist intellectual, he was educated elsewhere, and he's working amongst people who are just a generation or two outside of slavery in the rural South. So when she says, the people are there are, are honoring him. They have a party every year, year in which they, they honor him. They gave him a box. The box contained nothing but junk, a headless doll, some dirty lace, a rabbit skin. Dr. Copeland scrutinized each, each article. Don't throw them away. There is use for everything. There are gifts from our, our guests who have nothing better to, con to contribute. We'll find some purpose for them later. Then suppose you look over these here boxes. 
and sacks so I can commence to tie them up. There ain't, there ain't gonna be no, no, no room here in this kitchen. Time they pile in for refreshments. So Dr. Co, so she writes with some authenticity, two different voices, two different black voices, right? Two different black voices and she, there's a very authentic rendering of the tension between the two. Now, Carson McCullers was a, I think at this point, someone might correct me, 23, 24 year old white woman from the South writing from the point of view of an older, well-educated black man and his tension with a lower income rural black society. But she hit on the tensions well, and she took it to the issue of social justice in part because she was able to note rifts in education, rifts in income. Um, and the semiotics and the voices that went with those riffs, right? What you also have to do, and this is a tool that I try to give my officers, is like just like we can't stop with multiculturalism, we can't stop with saying, hey, there's a problem here. Um, because social justice means I have to deal with every individual that I meet. I have to say, how does this issue render itself in your life, right? Because I can't just take you, like Dean Moriarty would say, say, well, you're this type of woman, you're this type of Latino, you're this type of Black, here are your problems, and here's what I've decided this, the solution is. Who is this individual, right? How does it, how does the, how do the tensions, the history, the language, how does it render itself with this individual right here? Because social justice obviously has to ultimately be about that person in front of you, not the group that you've decided they represent. Um, another favorite is Gloria Anteldua, um, her essays from this, this bridge called My Back, which were essays and poems written by women of color when they felt alienated from the feminist movement uh, of the 1970s. Uh, they felt that it was mostly serving the needs of, of white women, of middle-class white women. And so, um, and so what was fascinating about that is then they got into, you see the wrestling matches going on. That's why I love this book, that it's like. Am I back? Okay. I got muted. All right. Hey, I'm a windswept swayed bridge, a crossroads inhabited by whirlwinds. And this is Gloria Anthony, uh, talking about her place in so many of her of her social justice movements. All right. You're a, so this is she says this is what she's told. Your allegiance is to La, to La Raza, the Chicano movement, say members of my race. Your allegiance is to the third world, say my black and Asian friends. Your allegiance is to your gender, to women, say feminists. Then there's my, uh, my uh, allegiance to the gay movement, to the socialist revolution, to the new age and to magic and the occult. So I ask them, I, at one point I have a picture of a giant, uh, I use a slide, I have a picture of a giant stone and I say, is culture a monolith? And if culture is not a monolith, social justice and the routes to it can't be either. I right, have to deal with every individual as um, as an as an aggregate form. Um, cultural incapacity, like you find with Dean Moriarty, I think, also goes along with cultural blindness. The idea that when people say, "Well, I'm colorblind. I just don't see these things. I everyone's the same." Well, obviously, their their hearts are often, I think, in the right place with that sort of thing, but. Um, you know, the, the idea that you would mute, and then you have, to, well, you have to ask when you look at these different pieces, when you look at the literature that you use, if there is a, a character, if there is a narrative about characters that are marginalized, could you take that character and make him or her anything else and the story would just be the exact same story? And if so, is that a matter of cultural blindness? Is there something unique about the experience of the character because the character is a woman, because the character is black, gay, whichever, right? Um, so this is a point on which I hit with my officers. And I use James Baldwin a lot when I 
when I talk about this, when he says, you know, it's the 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 Negro, as he would say, you know, is a unique American character that you can't simply, you know, drain that reality out of him, out of her, and just becomes the American. Um, and so because lots of my and, and this becomes very touchy for officers in many cases, they they really they wrestle with James Baldwin a lot. Um, I can show them Dostoevsky and they can say, OK, this is where authority, you know, trampled on the individual and what the problem is. And, you know, I can show them even Steinbeck uh, when I show them Grapes of Wrath. And I say, here's what Tom Joad says about police officers. OK, yeah, I love Tom Joad because he was just. He was that secular socialist Christ that was like a Christ figure that was right in the face of authority and saying, this is what's happening. And at one point, Tom Joad says, you know, um, if it were the law, they were working with Ma, we could deal with it. But it's not the law. They're trying to make us cringe and crawl, right? Because he makes it clear. And I have to explain to my officer learners often that we're talking about the Dust Bowl and, um, the Great Depression and these peripatetic white rural populations making their way out to California. So now they are wandering people coming into towns. Well, the issue of social justice isn't race at this point. It's class and it's geography, right? Uh, it's economics. And you had outcast whites being treated this way by the police, right? And so I ask them, I ask them to deconstruct it. What's going on in terms of the dynamic of social justice with the, you know, these policemen are, are public servants. They've taken an oath. Yet when these people come through, are those police officers advocates of social justice? Which it means when you become a social, you become a public servant, right? It means you're going to be an advocate for some sort of social justice. Or do they fall into the utilitarian philosophical mindset of the greatest amount of happiness for the largest number of people? Well, if the largest number of people are the people in this town, and they don't like the others that have come in, then I will advocate for the larger, right? Um, so this is a case, now this is a case where, well, again, Steinbeck was not himself a, you know, quote unquote, oaky, but the voice was authentic and the voice was sympathetic. It, it went beyond just, you know, let's be nice to these people, they're amusing or they're, you know, not harmful, that they are humans for whom we have to advocate. And even to the point of, at one point, there's a great passage in which a landowner says, wow, if, if the Blacks and these Okies actually got together in the South, we landowners would be in big trouble. Um, so part of understanding whether literature is useful in that quest for social justice is, does it recognize and address the question of social justice, right? Um, Kerouac, still love him to death, right? Still okay to love Kerouac, but Kerouac was not overly concerned. He was probably kind of a Jack Kennedy. He wasn't like, you know, maybe not a raving bigot, but not overly concerned about the social justice, social justice in the lives of these people, right? And, um, and in fact, um, sometimes when, you know, characters can be, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of harping on on the road because I've been back to it recently, but, um, at one point, a, a character even uh, he thinks that a, a a gay man is making it uh, is um, looking at him in some sort of desirous way, and so he shows him a gun, you know. And, uh, and he says, "I don't even know why I did that. I just felt like I just felt like doing that." So it was like, you know, he can go from being sympathetic to, well, you know, you can abuse people when you need to, you know. Then back to, hey, I'm a social rebel and I'm all for social justice. So. I'm not rambling too much here, but I, I feel like there's such a great amount of, uh, there's such a, a wealth of information and a wealth, uh, so many conduits to culture, but we have to be mindful of how the voice plays out and whether the voice is about social justice, about representation, or simply about using individuals as props, more or less. Um, and actually, that's probably a, a really great point to end on, um, this reflection on voice. Uh, and I guess we have another just couple minutes if anyone wants to raise a question in the chat on, on YouTube. Uh, but this also gives me a chance to say that um, 
Ed will be back with us at the Center for Literary Arts for a virtual reading on October 17th yes. at 7.30 p.m. So yes. we'll get to hear your work. Um, mm. And in addition, you know, now that we've had your, your discussion of some of these other uh, authors and how they treat their characters. Right. Um, Thank you. Looking forward to it. That'll be great. <laughs> So it, it actually doesn't look like uh, we have a question that's come up, but uh, but thank you again for being with us for Indie Lit. We look forward to seeing you on the 17th and, um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Great, you as well. Thank you so 